Good afternoon, David. How are you doing? Doing fantastic, Kevin. How are you? Awesome. Doing really well. Doing really well. I've uh, been looking forward to having this uh, conversation here. What I would like to do uh, is to get started with this uh, video. Let's talk about UNS and Absolutely. the power of UNS for industry. Great topic. A lot of conversations around UNS and, and how do you leverage it and what is Huge. it and those types of things. So uh, very, very timely. Yeah, good. Awesome. Uh, so what we'll do for everybody watching this video is to go through uh, some of the background of where this UNS topic is coming from, why you want to start to consider these kinds of ideas, uh, and then move through a sequence of ideas to then explain it. Uh, then we're going to get into some real meat about what it uh, is, how it looks, how it works, and where you can get some real value out of it. Uh, uh, we'll get pretty deep. All right, let's get into it. So. The uh, sequence we're going to go through uh, are uh, to, of course, start with introductions. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, business challenges. What is unified namespace? Apply it to manufacturing. Dig into some really interesting examples that Dave's created, which are really awesome. And then uh, we're going to take a step back just to make sure, hey, why is this valuable? Does it really make sense? And there's some really big impact that gets me kind of excited about the stuff that I really want to review. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about some of the how to execute kind of ideas, and then uh, uh, we'll finish it out. So uh, I'm Kevin Jones, CEO, founder of Ectobox. Uh, we're an industry 4.0 uh, integrator. And David, introduce yourself. Yeah, so David Schultz, I'm the owner of G5 Consulting. I'm the you know, system, you know, industry 4.0 system integrator. Uh, do a solution architect and really involved in helping companies uh, you know, through their digital transformation journey. Exactly. Awesome. All right. So to start this idea, let's think about some of the challenges that manufacturers have out there. There are, as I think of them, the short term or near term or immediate challenges that plants have in the four walls. And then there are the bigger global industry kinds of challenges in the plant. It's machine downtime, production throughput, quality on time delivery, all those kinds of typical challenges that manufacturers are trying to, to solve to get the product out the door on time, on price, on quality. Uh, but then there are these bigger uh, competition, fork force, inflation kinds of challenges that they face in the market. And manufacturing, in some respects, is getting more complicated, more difficult. And there are studies out there that say something to the effect of uh, for uh, uh, every uh, 11 out of the 12 companies that are in existence today, 11 of those are going to either go out of business or be subsumed or acquired by their competition. If they don't take on these ideas of moving from what we call industry 3.0, automating your manufacturing processes, the, the machines with PLCs and, and whatnot, to industry 4.0, which is uh, automating your business processes, and at the core of that is using that data. So the idea is that manufacturers to, to, to really compete and thrive is that they need to become uh, uh, data-driven organizations, data-driven manufacturers. They need that deeper visibility to get right down to the plant floor and use that data that they haven't been using for years and years and years. That it's a, it's a gold mine. It's a, it's a huge gold mine. Uh, when we look at companies, there are a couple ways that we look at companies. One is that we see this ERP system at the top of the organization and the plant floor with the machines and the people. And there's a huge disconnect between the two of them, pieces of paper and spreadsheets. Uh, and that middle layer is where the business really happens. ERP, uh, strategy, orders, orders converted to work orders, uh, uh, travelers, bills of material, um, inventory, accounting, all those kinds of higher level uh, concepts, but the ERPs can't really work right at the plant floor. They're not built for that. Uh, and you need a way to be able to get that work order down into the plant to schedule that work, uh, to uh, figure out how well you actually performed, to organize the people, the machines, and the raw materials all together to get those products out on time, uh, on budget, uh, and uh, on spec, on quality. Uh, it's a difficult process, and that middle ground really is what we think of as the an MES layer, the manufacturing execution layer. That manufacturing execution system ends up being the glue to hold the two together. But the real point here uh, is that there's a big disconnect, uh, uh, and companies don't have that real-time visibility to the plant floor to understand what's going on. 
really what should be happening. The holy grail here is that companies should be connecting everything and everyone uh, into that network. At that point, everybody in the organization at all layers of the organization are going to know in real time what's going on in the rest of the, the layers. Stakeholders are going to have uh, an understanding of what's going on in real time uh, for the current status uh, and also the future status. What they're going to be doing is to become real data-driven manufacturers. Uh, another perspective uh, that we take to of companies is, okay, great. Maybe we're convinced we should become more data-driven and we're not becoming data-driven just by using the ERP system and the data in the ERP system because it doesn't really give us what's going on on the plant floor. So what some companies will do is say, hmm, well, okay, let's put the ERP system right at the middle. And then let's try to become a data-driven organization. So let's connect that ERP system to other systems and let's connect those other systems to other systems. And then we end up with a, a, a plate of spaghetti with all these discrete connections. Very difficult, very expensive to maintain. You wanna swap out a system, uh, it's next to impossible. And sometimes that uh, uh, technical debt, that negative inertia then stops companies from actually making those changes and making improvements. So what we like to do is to say, hey, there's another way, there's a better way. Let's change the perspective and not have that ERP system at the middle, but rather create a data hub a single version of the truth, a single pane of glass to which everything connects. And then at that point, if you have every system connecting to that central data hub, that grand central station of data, then at that point, every system should be able to give data to that data hub and then be able to pull data out of that data hub, uh, and publish and subscribe that data, and then use it to do whatever is necessary. At that point, every system in this whole ecosystem will be able to have an idea of what's going on. This is the idea of a, of a unified namespace. Uh, there's another piece of a tool that we'll get to in a second, which is the structure of the data. How are we structuring the data for everything that we're putting together here? We're gonna use an, uh, an idea from ISA 95 part two, which is uh, the hierarchy, uh, enterprise, site, area, line, and cell. So uh -huh. let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. The the namespace, let's think of the word namespace. A namespace is essentially a system to identify or uniquely refer to, you know, related objects or concepts or, or, or ideas. Uh, and what we're talking about is a unified namespace, a, a namespace that unifies, unifies, us, unifies a whole bunch of namespaces effectively. Uh, and that unified namespace being unified becomes the single place where all of that data goes, that single hub of communication. Uh, and then uh, because we're reporting all that data into that single place, that becomes uh, that provides the visibility into the current state of what's going on for all those systems being reported. And then when we're reporting that data, we're putting that data into a specific structure of the business, in, into a specific structure, if you will. Uh, uh, it's these ideas combined that really provide the foundation for what we think of as a digital transformation. If you're going to become a digital uh, or data driven organization uh, and you're going to move from industry 3.0 uh, with siloed systems, disconnected systems, discreetly connected systems in ERP that doesn't have a sense of what's going on and people not you know, having real time visibility into the plant floor and you want to move to industry 4.0 using the data to really drive the, the business forward. You need a single version of the truth. You need that single place where you can go to understand what's going on. Uh, David, do you want to expand on some of this? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, it's. I just want to build a little bit on that. The whole idea of this unified namespace, and that's what we're going to start showing some examples of. You know, as you're going through this, these steps to digital transformation. One of them is you start building out your unified namespace, which is a a whole collection of a lot of smaller namespaces. And while we're going to focus on assets and the hierarchy, the lines and the cells, and then some of the functions that exist within there, your namespaces are comprised of, you know, even things like what do our screens look like, or the namespace of what's the information that's going on those screens. It's the namespace of what's our machine actually doing on the plant floor and all the various transactions that go in and out of it. Um, so, you know, it, it's so important to get this right early on is when you're building those namespaces, you know, think very, you know, very deliberately on what it is that we're doing. Um, it's because these are going to now be the model for everything else that is is that you're going to build out 
you know, and you're going to expand those systems. So as you build in more intelligence, you're going to start building on what is already there in the existing namespaces. So the unified namespace just it, it will grow over time. Uh, another way to think of the namespace is I use the word uh, semantic data model. And it's one of those when you look at that namespace, you actually know, oh, yeah, I'm looking at maybe it's an asset or I'm looking at a hierarchy within the plant. I'm looking at a line namespace or maybe I'm looking at, oh, this is my HMI namespace. So that's how I'm doing all my visualization. You know, that's it's a semantic data model where you can look at it and know exactly what it is. Awesome. Uh, and that's some of that stuff. We're going to get to uh, several of those details, and that's what gets me really excited about this. The fact that you can really build out a whole model of the plant. Uh, this ends up being, you know, the ERP system is is a model of how the whole business works from a high level, from an outside uh, external perspective. But the, the 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 MES, if you will, and this unified uh, namespace, uh, even more so, becomes a definition of how the company, how the plant works, uh, mm-hmm. uh, which is is really exciting. So let's actually take a look at that model. Uh, this is one of the aspects of the unified namespace. I mean, I, in some ways, when I, I, I look at this idea, <clears throat> I break it out into two, two basic components. I think of it as it's that central single hub, and that single, central single hub has the definition, the, the structure of the business in that data model. Uh, uh, so let's take a look at that, that aspect, that data model. Again, the idea is to borrow from the ISA 95 Part 2 structure uh, of enterprise site area line and cell. So let's think of, you know, hey, we're based in Pittsburgh. Uh, Dave's based in uh, Milwaukee. Let's say that we have Coca-Cola as a plant uh, and we have, or excuse me, Coca-Cola as a company and we have a plant in Pittsburgh. And within Pittsburgh, maybe we have our own ERP system uh, as opposed to an enterprise level ERP system. Uh, and we also have a bottling line or a bottling area, if you will. So enterprise site area. And in that bottling area, we have a line, line one. And within that line, we have a PLC. Uh, we're going to have a list of all the tags for that PLC. Uh, and that data is going to be populated into that unified namespace uh, with all of the values from that PLC, plus all the other PLCs on that line or the, all the other lines as well. And at the same time, what we'll be able to do is to have data in this whole system about what else is going on, the MES system and the current OEE for uh, this whole area or for the line, the downtime for these systems. We'll be able to uh, see the data for what work orders we're working on, the routing. Again, Dave will get into these details. But the, the idea here, uh, I'll just go back real quick, is that if we're connecting all of these systems, then we should be able to uh, uh, have real-time access to a lot of information. One of the examples that I typically talk about a lot are, let's say we have a PLC publishing data into the unified namespace, into that line one uh, uh, line. Then uh, let's say we want to calculate OEE. The MES system is also connected to this unified namespace. It will subscribe to that data uh, and then use that information plus some other information it's gotten from the, the unified namespace, calculate OEE, maybe display in an MES screen what OEE is right now, but maybe want, we want to record that, or excuse me, report that up to the corporate level. So the MES system then can publish that data right back into the unified namespace, and the business intelligence tool can then subscribe to that data and display, hopefully, what is a nice uh, uh, curve or line going up about OEE over time as you start to use the, the data and improve what's going on with that real-time visibility. That's uh, the kind of the next level of down of, of how this this works. Uh, and this is a decent representation of, of how things look. Um, uh, so with this, you know, again, the idea, you've got some of your machines down here. They're reporting up through whatever kind of methods. We're then converting that data with some kind of edge gateway device. I mean, architectures can be different across a lot of different situations. This is one example of a company uh, that, that we're working with. Uh, but this uh, data would then be converted to, for us, some of the technologies we like to use, MQTT Sparkplug B, uh, to push the data into an MQTT data broker like HiveMQ, uh, uh, and then have systems like a historian, like the Canary historian, subscribe to that data and store the data uh, so that a process or 
controls engineer uh, can look at the data in the Axiom visualization tool and understand what's going on. But at the same time, the MES can subscribe and publish and you know things start to, to work together really well. Uh, Dave, any comments on this or you want to kind of expand on even how transactional systems can start to come to play here? Yeah, so one of the things that we've talked about before is that at least within the technology of the MQTT, there's really not a way to confirm or acknowledge that a message was passed back and forth. And so, you know, one of the tricks that we use for getting around that acknowledgement for that transaction is we'll also have whatever the intended recipient of that information actually publish back the acknowledgement of, of, yes, I got that. So, you know, from a, a transactional you know type space of, you know, maybe there is a new work order schedule that came down, that MES tool can acknowledge, yes, I have that, I've now scheduled it for a particular line. Um, so that's that's one of the ways that we go around, uh, go about doing that. Um, and there might be some other technology that resides in this UNS. I know we talk a lot about MQTT and then specifically with that spark plug B, but there might be a couple of other services that are sitting there to help facilitate some of this information being moved around um, and to uh, it sometimes maybe just providing that single endpoint. So there's other things that can exist uh, within that. But I think just to keep it very simple here, you know, we're really just going to be looking at some data that's moving from one system to another and that that data payload can be consumed, um, you know, through one of the mechanisms that we have for doing that. So one of the uh, questions that we get a lot uh, at this point is, all right, love the idea of, of a single version of the truth. We want to become a data-driven organization. We want to move from industry 3.0 to 4.0. And so we want to start to implement this, uh, mm -hmm. but we're struggling with understanding how to organize this data. Uh, and where does the OEE fit within the Unified? Where is the UNS? Where is the, or excuse me, where is the MES? And all of these other kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. Let's start to talk about some of that. So here are some illustrations that Dave has put together for the unified namespace for site, line, uh, uh, and cell. Uh, and we have a lot of others as well. So Dave, do you want to talk a little bit just to introduce, well, maybe even first, I know some people have asked from prior videos we've done with these, they've asked like, how did you put these together? What, oh, yeah. Just real yeah, quick, so the technology, I, you know, the, and then let's talk about the kind of building it up from the site all the way down. Yeah, so the tool that I'm using to build this is we're just looking at the tag browser uh, within the inductive automation within the ignition development environment. And so that's what I'm using to present these. And it's mostly because there's a nice little visualization that comes with the tag browser. I want to be very clear, I can actually build these unified namespaces with some other tools. We've talked about, um, you know, Factory Studio or Frameworks. We've talked about using a product called Hybyte. Um, mm -hmm. I can actually build some of these with uh, Canary, even though the historian, it has the capability of just taking some raw tag data, creating a model with it and publishing that model out as well. Um, but you know, really for the, the purposes of, of illustrating how I like to build the models, um, it just happens to be that this tag browser works very well within Ignition. Good. So uh, let's talk about, introduce us to this, this company, if you will. Uh, and the structure of the company. And I have here the site model to start with. Sure. So what we're starting to build out in, and there's another view or another you know, to a screen that we'll, we'll take a look at. So the way that I approach building a unified namespace is starting from scratch. And you know, again, this is that, that one of the steps of part of your transformation is once you get everything connected is, is start building these semantic data models or the, um, this, this unified namespace. Um, so I'll generally start with assets and we'll take a look at that. And what I mean by asset, it's going to be like a utility, you know, a compressor or a chiller or, uh, you know, your water system. Like sometimes you'll have a, a, a deionized water or, you know, an RO system, those types of things. Those are your assets. And then I'll move into actually building that that structure of the business. So what we're looking at here is that's a concept of I have that ISA 95 structure of the enterprise site area line cell. So, and it's not just made up of the, the hierarchy of the, of the location or a geographical uh, position, it's also some of the functionality that exists. So within this particular fictitious plant that I've put together, it's called Enterprise, I'm in its site one, we have the functions that are of the CRM of, and the ERP. And within a CRM, this is your uh, customer relationship manager, I have created a quote for Hank Hill over at Strickland Propane, shows you what the, the product was or the item, gives you a description, tells you the quote number, um, how much, and then what that unit of measure is. 
So the idea is that anytime a quote is created, that payload gets published to the unified namespace so that it can be consumed by other systems that might be interested in the fact that, hey, there's a new quote that just got um, you know, sent out to a particular client and, and would want to know some of the information that's there. And one of those activities is the idea of being able to forecast based on how many quotes we have out there. And in this particular case, we now have our ERP system that's doing our purchasing and it's creating our manufacturing work orders say, oh, very interesting. You just now quoted some more orange juice. That tells me I'm going to be making a particular product uh, here in the near future. That's just some of my logic that's there. I've created a purchase order in my ERP system. It's gone out to uh, Brian Adams over at Sanction Food Colors. It's I need, you know, the item is called color. It's the juice color. I have a purchase order in the quantity and the unit of measure. So you're going to see some of these, um, you know, similar data sets that come on here. But, you know, even though they are the same, these are different semantic data models. They're built on different underlying uh, technology or under underlying data model itself. These are instances of a UDT um, within Ignition is how that's referenced. Um, so and then, then, oh, go ahead. Just to kind of set the context and, and back up a little bit to, to help people out here. So let's say the small diagram uh, that I have back here, let me make that a little mm -hmm. bit bigger that will actually help a lot I think uh, so for this little diagram and then let's bring this image back up again so let's say we have an ERP system here that ear uh, or excuse me a CRM system over here mm -hmm. uh, salesperson sells an order uh, the CRM system says hey I've got an order pushes publishes that data into the unified namespace then at that point where does it go into the ERP system for demand planning then yeah, it, it can. So, 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 I mean, in this case, I'm actually showing a quote, but it could easily be a, you know, okay, we now okay. have a sales order. So there's a okay. manufacturing work order that's actually that 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 last but, item okay. that's here on the list. You're right, right. So so uh, a quote, uh, and we want to uh, uh, do some demand planning based on the quote. Certain percentage mm -hmm. of quotes will actually come through. So publish the quote from the CRM into the unified namespace. Let's say we're doing our demand planning in the ERP. ERP will subscribe to and take that quote data uh, uh, and then process it for demand planning. Uh, and then at that point, um, let's say maybe that quote is turned into an order uh, 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 in the CRM that could be consumed by the ERP as well. ERP processes that, creates a work order that then is published into the UNS and then, you know, the workflow just kind of continues from there. Is that the concept? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's that every system is informing decisions on on, a, on another system or multiple systems. Awesome. Great. Yeah. yeah. All right. So what's next? Yeah. And so I just finishing out, there's a work order at the bottom and that's we're actually going to go and make a particular product. And it tells us, OK, who's the client? We're actually making this for inventory. Um, and then what the you know the, the model number, what the product is, when it needs to be done and how much needs to be made. So it's that semantic, but you can look at it, you know, oh, yeah, that's a work order and, and all these things make sense. So there's a namespace that is known as a work order in this place. It exists at the site because within this particular enterprise, that's how they manage work orders, purchase orders and quotes rather than maybe at the enterprise level. So it's the semantic data model. That's where it logically makes sense within the organization itself. Awesome. Good. All right. Which models next? So let's go to that asset real fast. I think that's the very first one um, that you have. Yep. And so, for, you know, when I talk about building a unified namespace, this it's I think it's a little bit easier to understand from the, the perspective of just an asset itself. It's a semantic data model. So instead of looking at, you know, you can say I have several parameters that are coming off. In this case, I'm going to use my compressor. Um, and so I have my flow, my pressure and my temperature and my vibration. Oftentimes, how it gets presented to the business is just as those numbers and there's a tag value, but it doesn't have a lot of meaning or context. So I've created a semantic data model of my compressor. And within that, that model of the compressor, I have a model of a motor that is also giving me current speed and vibration. So there's eight different pieces of data or tags that are coming from a system, whether it, it's probably coming from an OPC server, but you know there's multiple locations you could be getting that. And I'm now creating it into a model where I can look at it and say, oh, this is my compressor out in my utilities area of site one. Furthermore, I can use the uh, the parameters capability within Ignition and I can start putting some of that static information on it. So the area I get to capture, I can also give put the site on there and I just realized I need to add on the site one. Um, but I have the manufacturer, I have the model, I have a compressor number that could be used by some parameters that are within uh, within the flow itself. 
I've also brought over my asset ID that comes from my CMMS, or that could be part of your EAM system. But now if you're starting to consume this data model somewhere else within your, your namespace, you'll have that information that's all brought uh, through and, and they can subscribe to that information. So I know exactly what it is that I'm looking at. It's a compressor one over in utilities and here it's uh, the manufacturer and, and you know models and those types of things. So this is uh, within the enterprise and the site. Uh, we've got uh, a line called utilities. We have a compressor. Mm -hmm. uh, compressors being used for whatever might be used in the plant. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the data from the PLC of the compressor that you can get. Uh, mm -hmm. And also you have, I think, I think of this as nameplate data, really. It's, yeah, parameters it's exactly what it is. Yeah, so there's the, the, the static data as parameters and then the dynamic, more the tags as the tags. And then how might you use this data? So often, yeah, oftentimes when you're wanting to consume it is you're now consuming it as a model of a compressor, but you're also able to differentiate of, you know, let's say if I'm in a refinery, I'm a hydrogen compressor versus what might be a an air compressor that's used for maybe my instrument air. And you can delineate the performance of those things, or you can look across, say, different Atlas Copco models that you have in your and across the enterprise. So that that information is presented. So it's a very easy way of starting to take maybe different systems and different applications and bring them together for an easy analysis. So rather than having to go out and, and pull, okay, what are the tags for all of my air compressors in my enterprise? If this information has been published to a UNS, it makes it very easy to capture that information. And maybe you've already said this, but is this also a place where you could potentially store some of the specs for the machine? Absolutely. Not this rate or uh, its normal production rate, you know, all that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you could put a lot of that. There's a lot more manufacturing information that could come in here. And, you know, honestly, you could, as part of your unified namespace, start putting in, say, a manual for this because, you know, the technology that's underlying is so long as I can consume the file type. Um, I can very easily get that. So you could certainly bring that in as part of the model as well. Um, so we, you know, we, go ahead. We would have a, a document object or a blob uh, object uh, as a as a, a tag or a, a, an item uh, here, <laughs> and then that could be consumed through the UNS by some other system. And then uh, the let's say the the maintenance guy or gal in the field on their device can then open up that that file uh, and then look at whatever they need to look at while they're working on the machine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. Cool. Awesome. What's next? Yeah, so let's uh, zoom back out here a little bit. And uh, so we looked at the enterprise. Let's start taking a look at the line now. So there should be a line tag in here. There we go. So looking at the line tag, um, what I've done is, again, we start off with the assets, and then we start building out the overall structure of the business, starting with the actual physical locations. Now we're going to move into the, the line. And you can see within the line, I have you know several namespaces that are actually part of that. Um, starting at the top, um, I have an asset ID. So typically, even though you don't necessarily work on a line per se, your your CMMS or your EAM is going to assign that line an asset ID, and and that's what I've done here. Um, I also use a parameter as line number, uh, which tells me which line I'm working on. Um, that that parameter is also used through uh, in other parts of the system, but. Just doing a quick look, I can see I also have uh, three cells that are associated with this line model. Um, I can also get my in-feed counts, my out-feed counts. Um, I also have some other functional namespaces of my uh, last run. So that's going to tell me when we get into the, um, the track and trace. Um, so that gives me some of that track and trace capability of what was just produced. I also have a current run OEE. I have a shift OEE. And then I also have the manufacturing work order number sitting at the bottom. Um, one of the pieces that I do want to point out is oftentimes when you're looking at the state of a line, it oftentimes comes back as an integer. Um, one is just happens to be what it is in this case. But if it's on another line, that number might be a three. So how are you able to compare like and like? So I use this enumeration set. That's that state enum that says one. Oh, I'm now running. So I can now start looking at, you know, is my line running? Or is it you know, down? Is there a downtime of that type of thing? And is that planned or unplanned? Those are some of the, the metrics you look at. But this becomes the semantic model for um, and the namespace for a line. Do you have uh, an array here within this uh, enum for, for one equals this, two equals mm -hmm. that? Yes, thing? yeah, that's exactly what it is. Nice, awesome, yeah. great. Yeah, I'll do that. And okay. then finally, let's move over into the cell namespace. So let's finish off the, the hierarchy of the, the, the asset or the, the line structure. 
So here we are looking at a line, or excuse me, at a cell. And similarly, I have an asset ID for a cell, and it's, that's coming from the CMMS or the EAM system. So and it's very common to have a maintenance work order on it. So you can see there's now the CMMS. That's a functional namespace that uh, handles my uh, manufacturing work orders. And I also have the uh, the counts that are very common with um, you know looking at a cell, so we can start calculating you know our our availability, performance, and quality out of that. And I've done the same thing here, where I have a state uh, enumeration set, so I know that yep, my line one or my cell is also running. It's important to have it at the cellular level only because a cell could be down, but that doesn't mean that the line is down because there may be downstream processing that's occurring in there. So it's important to when you're doing these models to uh, make sure you put in as much granularity as uh, you can within it so you at least know what the, the state of a cell is. Um, one of the examples that I use later is that it's actually on a, uh, I believe it's on a case packer, and it's one of those, there's a jam, it's down, but my overall line is still running, and I'll, I'll show that. But something you can track of, wow, we sure get a lot of jams on that particular one. Um, and I think that might be a good case in point of what we end up doing with this whole uh, UNS, this whole structure here, is creating the model, again, for your business, for your <laughs> plant, yeah, uh, where you are building in the structure for how your plant actually works versus somebody else's, where yeah. you know one company's uh, uh, cells may work in completely independent of one another. Another, they might be in sequence on a line, uh, and you know, once one cell is down, the other one uh, is down immediately. And you can build in the logic uh, and get data from this whole system to be able to to determine that by looking at some of the mm -hmm. data. Dave's yeah. talking about. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Awesome. So, so let's move over into the, the 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 OEE namespace. So that'll be the run and the shift OEEs. Those are expanded out a little bit. Um, I believe it's right. Whoop! You just passed it. Yeah, I know. It's like, uh, you know, changing the channel on the TV and you get too far to the end. You decide, well, I'm just going to keep going. My I'm going already. So I uh, keep uh, taking it around the horn again. So what I've created here within the concept of the line is now we're going to start talking about some of the functional namespaces. And in this particular case, uh, we're going to use OEE as the metric. So that's our availability and our performance and our quality. And within this namespace, uh, you can see that I have those availability, performity, uh, performance, and quality out of there. Um, I've also brought in a product code, um, and it also gives me my runtime, my total runtime, and my unplanned downtime. And this is just particular run. So this is based on this RJ5000 that happens to be red juice in this particular example. This is the current manufacturing work order on this particular product code that I'm now making as, as a run. I've also done the same thing with my shift. So not only do I know how am I performing right now at this very minute and what's occurring, I can also take a look at what's happening uh, overall as a shift. So uh, if you scroll down a little bit, you can see I have all of the same type of information. In this case, the product code isn't doesn't make any sense because you've run a multiple or a lot of different product codes that are there, so that that's omitted. But I can see very quickly what my run OEE, what my shift OEE is, and I, I get my performance and availability and quality just you know very quickly. And I can use this to populate other visualizations, you know, and that information can now be consumed and like, hey, what's what's the run OEE, you know, right now on line one within this particular plant? So let's talk about uh, and tear down this run OEE just a little bit, if you don't mind. So sure. let's say we've built out the model. I have my PLC connected to a, a uh, a gateway device. It's pushing, uh, publishing data into the UNS. Uh, am I publishing my in-feed and out-feed uh, accounts directly into the run OEE uh, uh, namespace, or am I publishing that into the machine and then somewhere else? I'm actually then taking that data and saying, oh, this belongs into the run OEE in-feed, out-feed, and then where and how am I calculating uh, uh, performance quality and ability. yeah. So if if you look a little bit higher up, you'll see that that end feed count is actually where you're doing all the counts on this. Oh, end, you know, off the yeah. line itself is where all yeah. these calculations are being yeah. made. Yeah. So that's actually a totalizing uh, of the count. So most of the time, your PLCs they're going to have a continuous counter. It, it all depends on you know the overall how your your infra or how your plant is structured, but it's very common. Let's just say this is a packaging line that those counters are going to continue to increase. So I can see what my in feed and my out feed is, and if you scroll down a little bit more, there's actually going to be the waste at the very bottom. 
What the run OEE is looking at is only the counts for this existing product code from when we started this production run. So you notice those counts are lower and those are the counts that are actually used to calculate that OEE. So what's happening is that the OEE engine here is looking at those PLC tags that are coming in, those higher numbers, based on when this production order starts. It's running it through its calculation engine, and then it's publishing that information back out. So it's giving you that, that just for the counts of this particular production run itself. So you can see we brought in 600. Um, we've spit out 800 or 580 rather than there's 20 that have been rejected in there. So we are then from the PLC publishing the data into the line itself, into in feed and out feed through the mm -hmm. continuous value. Then separately, we are tracking the run. You know, the operator has selected a work order in the HMI that they have that then initiates the process for this run. Uh, and once that starts, we're then counting. Uh, uh, from that point, uh, the in feed and out feed values, uh, uh, and then in the OEE calculation engine, then generating and updating into all, all of the data into the run OEE uh, namespace, uh, the the OEE in feed, the OEE out feed, et cetera. And we're Absolutely, yeah. And, and then we're as we continue to update <clears throat> the data, we're continuing to update new values into the system as we Absolutely. rerun the OEE calculation. Yeah, so so as this runs every 60 seconds, it gets a new count and it's looking at that delta of from when I started to now. Um, if you scroll down a little bit, that those counts will be a little bit higher. Um, yep. So you'll yep. notice that since this shift started, we've now had an infeed count of 37 or 37, 32 and a reject uh, or an outfeed and a reject. So you can see we're actually doing pretty well. This particular production run is apparently giving them some some struggle here. <laughs> So then uh, drawing this back to this diagram, PLC reports data into the unified namespace. It's reporting data into the line mm -hmm. within this structure in the unified namespace. Let's say the OEE engine is in the MES system. So it subscribes to these value from the line. It runs its calculations and it reports the data or uh, publishes the data back into the run OEE within the uh, run OEE namespace within the structure in the, the unified namespace. And then at that point, any old system can uh, subscribe and work with the data as needed. Sure, absolutely. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so so let's skip over to the uh, the manufacturing work order uh, model. And so what the manufacturing work order model is, is telling us, okay, now we have a, a manufacturing work order that's been fed down to us from the ERP. Um, that, that information is presented, it's been scheduled, and now we're actually running a particular work order. So in this case, we know what the ERP order number is. Sometimes this is called the sales order. Um, so this is, you know, and this is actually SO39023. Um, I always seem to find my little uh, fat finger errors, you know, once we start recording the video. Uh, but in this case, it's telling us, you know, what the order is, uh, the description of it, how much we're going to make. Um, we know what the, what the scheduled rate is, what the standard rate is, and, and those rates are used for both scheduling as well as our performance. So the scheduled rate is, we, we know we're going to schedule at 1,100 cases per, or excuse me, at 1,000 cases per hour. So I give my line plenty of opportunity for, we know we can make more, but that's what we're going to schedule so we can maintain the schedule throughout the day. But I'm going to give it a standard rate of 1,100. And that's because that's how we're actually calculating our OEE. We know that we should at least be getting, you know, if, if we're running it at 100% and really at our best uh, capacity, we should be able to get um, 1,100 out. So if you actually are able to maintain that, that's that rate uh, throughout the production run, you're actually going to be a little ahead of schedule. And that information is all performed by this job specification that comes out. So, you know, looking at this right away, the answer or the information you can get is what's running on line one at site one within the enterprise right now, this minute. And you can see exactly what that that production line is is running right now. So then uh, for for this example, we might have, you know, some big display on the, you know, on, on a TV on the plant floor showing what's happening for all the cells you know mm -hmm. we could be pulling from the unified namespace the the run OE, you know have a as we call it kind of an and on chart of all the machines list of the machines mm -hmm. their status for some of the things we've already seen in some of these screens their status maybe interpret that status into a color red yellow mm -hmm. green uh we could show the uh, uh availability the, the performance and the quality uh, the OEE uh, calculation, the current work order that's in process, and that's also data that, uh, say, a production supervisor could walk around with a, uh, a ruggedized iPad uh, uh -huh. and see what's going on, and all the data is coming real time 
from from this uh, unified namespace. Absolutely. Yeah. The so job, oh, go, go ahead. Please. The job spec, can you break that down a little bit? What does this mean? Here? Yeah, so the job spec oftentimes coming out of your ERP and it's not built in here, but you're gonna have your build of materials. You're going to have, you know, on this particular run, you, you have your master data of what it should be in terms of when we're running standard red juice on this particular line, this is how it should be run because different lines will handle uh, different, you know, the same skew differently. And so this is now all handled and it comes through and it can be a part of your MES in this particular case. Um, we're just assuming that this comes in, the, the work orders are all managed in um, your ERP system. Um, so that's where we're getting this ERP order number. But in all of these examples, what I'm doing is, is, is we talked about earlier about how you can actually publish a document. This is actually a, a, a data set. So it's a table. Um, in this case, it's actually a SQL query that returns this data set that I then use to populate some of the other uh, the other tags that are in this system. So how but might another system use that data, especially a, a data set like that? How would that work? Uh, so well, in, in this particular case, um, you're probably just going to look and, and want to know exactly what's running on a particular line right now. Um, and this is also the same place where we would do that acknowledgement backup of, yes, I have this work order. I'm now, um, you know, I, I'll just send a flag that says this is what I'm running and that that manufacturing execution system that's managing the schedule or the ERP that's managing the schedule will now get the acknowledgement that, ah, yes, this person is now running um, this, this particular uh, manufacturing work order. The CRM can also consume this information because now you have a customer that wants to know, hey, where's my order? <laughs> The, the uh, customer service person can then look into the system and see what's going on and what the status is and can realize that, oh, this is currently on line one uh, right now. So we tell the customer your, your product is in manufacturing right now. Um, we're anticipating we're going to ship it today. Um, you know, it's another thing that I don't have demonstrated here, but we could actually have the um, you know, forecasted end time for this particular run order based on some of the other information that's here. Could this job so. spec maybe be a, a recipe? And then we could, uh, in other systems, mm -hmm. check if we're running to recipe using that. Yeah, data. that's yeah. It, it certainly could be. I mean, I'm I'm trying to keep it very simple so people fair, fair. understand just, what it is. But yeah, there, yeah, there's a lot of things this could be. But yeah, no, as no. you build out your namespace and start adding in that functionality, it absolutely could be um, part of the you know a recipe that's coming down, or a you know even a, a an order of manufacturing like some kind of batch like an ISA 88 type thing. I mean, there's there's a lot of information that could be presented here. Yeah, yeah no doubt. We, we can only address one situation in these mm -hmm. examples, but just trying to work on some of the ideas sure. with, to get people thinking about how else this could be uh, yeah. used. In Absolutely. So the last thing let's take a look at is the last run. So what the last run is that if we're doing some kind of track and trace uh, within an organization. So it should be the genealogy model. You just oh, genealogy, oh, there it is. A genealogy model, yeah. That genealogy model is the formal way of looking at it. Track and trace is what people um, know in, in, in terms of, you know, or how it's it's normally used colloquially speaking. So this is the last run. This is telling us what's the last product that just finished on this particular line. And looking at this model, I can see what's my begin date, um, what was the end date, um, what was the lot number that was created, what was the material, how much was its uh, unit of measure. Um, you know, other things that could have been on this is, you know, what was the, the sales order number or the manufacturing work order number? Um, you know, other things that could exist just, you know, in the overall system is, you know, you know, who's the operator? You could have had who the customer is for. There's a lot of information that can be presented here. But the idea is that I can see what's the material lot that's coming off of this particular one. So if somebody had a question, what's the last thing that just got run on line one? I can see what that particular lot number is. And then I can start doing some, you know, so there may be some quality um, events that need to occur. So when this this uh, line finishes, it publishes this last run that could then trigger somebody else to say, oh, I need to go do a quality inspection on this particular order. So this is part of our release criteria. Um, I know something just finished. Let's go out and do the check and then I can release it. Um, Going back to that same analogy, you know, these are all the events, all the transactions that occur. So publishing this information out would then trigger other events by other systems. And that's, you know, just a, a couple of for instances there. That's a really good for instance, because in fact, I was on a call earlier today with a company 
where they have some reports that uh, need to be generated for quality after the product is done. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we were talking about what is that event that defines that product done, that data would be uh, published into the unified namespace. We have another system watching for that data. Uh, and then as soon as that happens, report is generated, sent to the right people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Everybody's absolutely. And, and and that's the beauty of this this report by exception. And if there's now a change, yes. that yes. change can then yes. initiate other stuff to happen. So uh, if you want to mm -hmm. scroll back out and just kind of bring this all together, um, there should be an enterprise engine um, model. So here's the engine model. Is that the engine? Okay. Uh, yeah, you just had it right there. So we can scroll in. Let's just kind of leave it out here because if you scroll in too far, it's not going to make a whole lot of sense. But the idea is that now I can take these namespaces, these unified namespaces, and you know we've been focusing on site one and some of the information that you can get, but you can see that there's now a functional area of site two and site three. Now, this is coming from, a, it's another uh, inductive automation. It's the, the Cirrus link, it's the engine, so hence the name of the engine model. But this is now consuming all the information that is being published to the broker and it's being consumed by other systems. And in this case, it just happens to be um, Ignition. I can consume it in Canary. I can consume it in Factory Studio. I can consume it in Hybite. Anything that supports the Spark Plug B, I can consume this information. But right now, putting this all together, I can now look at any line in any plant across my entire enterprise, and I'm going to know what's running, how it's running, what's the last thing to run, and is there, if there is a downtime event, oh, you know what we didn't do? We need to look at the CMMS model real fast as well. So I apologize. We can also know is there, if there is a downtime event, is there a maintenance work order against it? So uh, real fast, let's skip over to the maintenance work order model. So here's that maintenance work order model coming out of the, in the cell namespace. I now have a downtime event, it's unplanned. There's a jam from the inlet of this particular cell. I can see when they uh, when the downtime occurred. I can see when the due date of when this, this uh, technician needs to finish it. I have the idea of the work order. I know the priority, I know the status, I have a work order number. So the question I can now answer very quickly is, I have a downtime state on my line or on my cell is there a maintenance work order? What's being done? What is the status of that? And I can very readily get that information. And some, another example that we talk uh, often enough about where uh, at the PLC, at the edge, having some logic for monitoring the system, doing some condition-based monitoring, you're a, 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 a SMR, SMRP guy, uh, mm -hmm. doing some condition-based monitoring, watching for particular conditions on uh, the various uh, uh, process uh, parameters. And if it goes over or under those conditions uh, a certain number of times in a certain period of time, maybe, then uh, it can trigger uh, the system to create uh, uh, a, to create a work order in the CMMS mm -hmm. down yeah. here. And Absolutely. that CMMS can have that data broadcasted out to the, to the, the maintenance uh, technician. And then he or she then goes out and takes mm -hmm. care of the issue. Yeah, I mean, tr traditionally how we do this, because every every event is time stamped, as I can say, oh, I have a downtime event. I caught that event being, you know, what's on the rising edge of the PLC. Somebody hit the, you know, the e-stop, you know, whatever it happens to be, I can see the downtime event. It's the idea is that the operator is going to, um, you know, try to try to get the, the line running again. If the operator can't, we'll create a, manu or a maintenance work order. The maintenance work order is then uh, created. The technician shows up, logs in and you get that timestamp and once the line's back up and running you can see that that cmms or the work order is cleared and the line's back up and running and you have the timestamps for those entire events yep awesome great yep. Uh, and awesome. then at that point too for the data we were a lot of what we've talked about is in situ uh, uh data in situ kind of situations look at what's happening real time right now get that real time visibility but the other idea too is that we want to store this kind of data mm -hmm. We'll get to that. We'll, uh, I think we should probably address that at, point, at some point in this conversation. Sure, uh, absolutely. Well. Yeah, so right. this is no. kind of the way of you go about creating your unified namespace. I always like just starting with assets, or maybe it's, you know, you could say that a cell is one of those assets you're going to create. Then you do the structure of the business, meaning the enterprise, the lines, and the cells. 
And then finally, you move to those functional areas. And that's what we talk about of, you know, whether it's a, ma a manufacturing work order or a maintenance work order, um, some OEE, some genealogy or track and trace, you know, those are all functions. But the idea is that they're all being published and, you know, they're, they're being consumed. Information is being published from all these nodes within an ecosystem. And then they're consumed to build out this unified namespace. And that's that's what we've done here. Awesome. Great stuff. All right. Uh, let's take a, a quick step back and think about this. So that was a whole lot of detail. I think we've packed into, I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes of that portion more detail than we probably ever talked about uh, the unified namespace at a deeper level. This is hugely, hugely valuable stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, I'm not sure that everybody watching this video might realize that. So why is this valuable? The the thing, I, the concept that I talked about at the beginning, where we have these uh, current, immediate, uh, uh, near-term kinds of challenges uh, uh, in our plant within the four walls, downtime, unplanned uh, downtime at that, uh, production, on-time delivery, quality, all mm -hmm. those kinds of situations. Uh, but there, we need to solve those in the moment, but we want the company to be around for a long time. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to have data to make better decisions about what we should be doing tomorrow and the next day and the next year and the year after that. And uh, the idea is that we should be doing more with this data. There's so much more value uh, in this data than just solving problems within the plant, within the four walls for today and tomorrow. Uh, so that's where we can start to get into ideas like let's enable people, let's empower the people. Uh, a phrase that Dave brought up earlier when we were preparing for the session. Let's go, oh yeah, right. We need to empower the people uh, to be able to understand what's going on in the plant, be innovative and drive that future forward because it's the people in the plant that are the ones that are most valuable. They're the ones who are really gonna enable the success of the organization and they need data. Let's take that idea a little bit further. Young people these days, the the young people in my house, the young people in Dave's house uh, and others, they're so used to working with and playing with the phones and the tablets and having immediate access to the data and working with that data, actually doing something with it. That's exactly what my son is doing around baseball. He loves doing that. Well, they're going to walk out into the, 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 the work environment and they're going to say, I want data because I want to have a positive impact here. Uh, and the companies that have this kind of capability are going to be more attractive than the companies that don't. They're going to be so much more attractive than the industry 2.0 and 3.0 companies. I've actually seen this. There are some, let's call them industry 2.5 and industry 3.0 companies that struggle to get people in the door mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. people don't want to work there because they're not current. They're not up to date. Uh, so this idea of the employee, the future becomes really interesting. And that's something that companies where they can use this kind of data for the medium term. The real value, I want to say the real value isn't the only value, but the 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 mind blowing value at this point is let's think about looking at the data uh, within your plant, uh, being able to model uh, that data uh, within the unified namespace, uh, be able to start to apply a, a artificial intelligence and machine learning to this data, and also to because you can connect that data for your plant to other plants and across the enterprise. Well, why stop there? Let's start to connect to your suppliers and to your customers. Uh, and if you're an OEM, let's enable uh, you to use that data to make the products improve themselves over time. Let's get the products to become better. Let's innovate and invent. Uh, uh, if you're an end user for as a manufacturer, let's share data with your customers about what's going on. Let's share data with your vendors to get better products in the door. And then at that point, uh, you can start to become a smarter company, make your product smarter, uh, uh, and uh, uh, start to actually sell your products in a different way. Uh, one of the ideas that I like to think about and talk about are ideas that I picked up, you know, some years ago from a guy named Bruce Sinclair in his book uh, called IoT Inc. Uh, he was a thought leader in IoT, uh, and he talks about as an OEM using that data to make the products become smarter. Uh, and what you end up doing is creating a better, closer relationship with your customers. And you don't have to then sell this $500,000 product that you put out the door every day as a CapEx uh, uh, project or expense. You can actually uh, understand how your, your customers are using it and move over to OpEx. 
have them pay a thousand dollars on an Amex and make it a really quick transaction to get that product in the door. And then you can actually get move even as far as results based uh, uh, relationships and business models with your customers, creating incredibly tight relationships with your customers. This data is is so powerful. You end up becoming a data company, much like Facebook, Google and all the other companies. So mm -hmm. there are uh, and this this long term value, the medium term value is all based on what we're doing in the short term. Again, companies will often ask us for, I need to understand my unplanned downtime. What are my machines doing right now? I'm not really sure and I need to know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Solving those, those in the plant problems. What we do is to put that MEA system in place, that basic small little uh, starter system, but then underneath it, we're laying a foundation intentionally. We'll lay a foundation with a unified namespace. The ideas that the, the architectures and the technologies so that we can extend that MES system and that eventually the idea is that that MES or that unified namespace, that architecture can then extend itself out across the whole enterprise and beyond. Hugely, hugely viable. Some Absolutely. additional thoughts you want to throw some some fuel on the fire? <laughs> yeah, nope, I think you got it. I mean, really, there's this, you know, incrementally you roll these types of solutions out and then there's value that you get short term, medium term, long term. It's that as you are further in the journey, it's there. There's just there. There's tremendously more benefits, incremental benefits, exponential benefits that occur because not only are you building in this technology, you're also building in a a way of thinking within your overall the culture of your business changes because we've gone from you know being operationally good to we've attracted the right people to you know we're, we're now data driven and we're doing subscriptions on on our stuff rather than just selling a, a piece of hardware. Great points and great summary. So that's a perfect lead into this idea. So huh. if you could, Dave, do you want to talk a little bit about this process of how to execute this? If we were to start from the beginning, how does this work? Yeah, absolutely. So we all start with this, this uh, what's called the inventory of the business. And that's really understanding how does our business operate from the time that we talked earlier about, I send out a quote to receiving an order and then actually manufacturing that work order, buying the raw materials and then shipping out the finished products and billing, what does that whole process look like? And what are all the steps in order to manufacture? That's inventorying the business. And then it's inventory the intelligence. That's all the smart things that are in the business. And those are not just the overall technology itself, but those are all the people that are involved in doing that. There's a lot of sometimes tacit knowledge or the tribal knowledge that exists. It's you want to start capturing where is some of this information. So it's inventorying the intelligence. Yes, it's your, your who's your PLC, who's your SCADA, who's your MES, but it's also who are the people uh, involved in doing that. And then it's IDing this valuable use case. So one of the things we like to look at is let's start with a, you know, what's sometimes called a proof of concept or it's called a, a, a pilot. I sometimes hate to use those words because they're somewhat of a pejorative, but the idea is let's start with something small, some low hanging fruit, where now let's start applying the overall methodology to it. And once that's done, you start connecting all of those systems. So for instance, we could go in, we could take a look at a line, we could build in you know, the, the machine, the line, the cell, um, those asset models, and then start presenting some information back um, to that. And now we're gonna start integrating it with the UNS. So I talked earlier about how you're gonna continue to build these things out and, and integrate in additional functionality. That's another one of those steps that's going to take place in there in terms of you know what once we've got everything connected it's let's let's connect it in a way that's these semantic data models and then finally let's start presenting the info so this is now where we start realizing okay we just did something what did we learn from that information and then finally let's start expanding that information out so the first pieces are, are very much you do those once and then once you get to the very end and it's it's the classic of you know, the, the of what you do today is based on what you know today. You know, what you do tomorrow is based on what you do tomorrow. As you learn more information, you start expanding that out and it becomes this iterative process that you just continue to follow, build, get more information, learn from that information and, and expand it and continue on. Yeah, yeah, great points. Uh, something to highlight, uh, some companies, or some people, I should say, it's not as much companies, but people will say, all right, I'm ready to solve a problem. Uh, I've got a hammer. I'm going to look for a nail that I can I can pound in. Well, let's actually back up a second and figure out 
if the nail is the the solution to the problem or if, if the nail is the problem to solve or if it's a, a a screw that we have to screw in that's the problem to solve or we need some glue to glue a couple pieces together mm -hmm. let's figure out what the business problem is and that's what these first two steps do yeah yeah, uh, it's, I, it's, start. yeah it's not just figuring out what the problem is and making sure you're using the right tool to fix it because you know if i am a yeah. hammer then every problem is a nail so and, yeah, and yeah, to exactly. your point problem might be the screw so yep yeah, yep yeah, exactly so with that said, uh, what, something we run into a lot are is a lot of big questions that come up pretty often, uh, and these are some of them. So do you want to talk about these uh, a little sure. bit? Sure. Yeah, so there were a lot of the question we get, well, where does this UNS live? And I think we're so used to the idea that we have a front end, which is our how we interact with a particular system through it's, it's that user interface, the user experience, it's the UI UX, and then there's some kind of back end, there's a data set. Well. The UNS is, is a, I mentioned earlier, it's more of a, it's a, it's a methodology, it's an approach, it's a way to start structuring all of your data and bringing it all together. The, the, the namespace itself, so we talk a lot about the broker and some of the other services, all that's doing is it's facilitating the information back and forth. The data itself is going to live in those systems that's providing that particular functionality. My track and trace information is going to exist in my track and trace system. My time series data is going to exist within my uh, process historian or my time series database. My ERP information is, uh, oddly enough, going to exist within the ERP. The only thing that a unified namespace is doing is facilitating the transaction of these semantic data models in this many-to-many -many architecture that whenever I produce intelligence or produce some information that these other systems are able to consume it. Um, so it looks like I actually um, uh, answered a couple of questions there, but you know, where does it live? Well, it's, it's like answering the question, where does the internet live? Well, it exists within your entire enterprise. Yeah, I, I think this uh, diagram here uh, kind of helps illustrate it. If you're providing the current state uh, and to provide the, the current state in that single hub, you're not going to be storing all of the data. You're simply providing all of that data within the model of uh -huh. the, the plant, within that business model to every other system that wants it. And then it's up to those systems to then use that data, to push the uh -huh. data in, to make that data available, and for various other systems to pull the data to use it in whatever to, uh, whatever way they want. Historian to subscribe and historize all the data for all the PLCs, uh, for the MES to pull the in-feed and out-feed, et cetera, uh, run its calculation and push the data in, uh, et cetera. So the, the data doesn't live within this, this idea of the unified namespace, and it is kind of, you know, Where's the internet? That's a good, yeah, good it's, 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 and maybe it's like the living document, you know, whatever that means. So. Yeah. Well, what about this last one? Yeah. So, you know, if you don't have a device, so we talked earlier about in, you know, getting in some of the tech, uh, the technical details in the architecture is that we'll utilize the Sparkplug B payload. And, and I really like that for the, sometimes it's called telemetry data. Sometimes it's, I call it SCADA data. But really for me, Sparkplug B is very good for you know, that type of information because it has the concept of say like a command um, that exists within it. But uh, you know, the, the worst part about the, or the best part about the MQTT is that you can publish to any topic. The worst part of MQTT is you can publish to any topic. So we'd likely utilize that Sparkplug B specification in order to make sure that we're getting the right things or communicating with the right other things. Because the last thing you'd want to do is hit go on line one and it, for some reason you actually publish to go on line two. Um, that'd be very bad. So if you now, go ahead. No, no, you keep going. I was going to okay. summarize it a little. Okay. And then so if you do have a device that is, does not support our minimum technical requirements, whether that's MQTT or with the, the spark plug specification, that's where we can start utilizing some of these uh, gateways or some other edge devices that'll start consuming that information for you building those semantic uh, data models right at the edge and then publishing in your unified namespace. So for instance, if I have a, an older PLC that doesn't support that technology, I can uh, utilize one of these gateways or some kind of an edge device to package that information for me, create that data model and publish it over Sparkplug B to where now everything can uh, be consumed by the rest of that unified namespace um, because we're utilizing that minimum technical requirement of the MQTT and, and ideally Sparkplug B. So using this diagram as an example, uh -huh. maybe we are uh, uh, down here speaking Modbus TCP uh, uh, and we need to connect to that with KEP server uh, uh, and, and then translate that, get that data 
uh, into some protocol. Uh, but ultimately, what we want to do is to get, uh, or I could even, you know, let's say maybe even just remove this altogether and say okay. that, uh, uh, you know, with this edge gateway device, we can read Modbus TCP, uh, but then in this edge device itself, maybe we're going to train, well, maybe we will translate that into MQTT Spark Plug B, get it into the data broker, and then at that point, we're using MQTT Spark Plug B as the standard uh, for yeah. communication in the unified namespace, and then we'll take any other device, like you said, uh, and use edge devices to uh, convert whatever brownfield devices That's are speaking. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you know, on that, you you can there still be instances where you're going to want to use a flat MQTT. It just it just makes more sense that way. So we're going to support both and that's fine. Um, but really, once you're getting into that that skater region or things that are more to the, you know, closer to that plant floor, you know, to me, that's where I want to have that type of information reside. But, you know, those those are absolutely your spot on. That's part of that minimum technical requirements we have. Awesome. Good. Uh, and also, there we brought up a number of topics like MQTT, MQTT Spark Plug B, data brokers, high byte, uh, 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 edge gateway devices, uh, and a bunch of other topics. It, you know, the, the canary uh, the historians. We cover a lot of these uh, in our uh, respective YouTube channel. So I would definitely recommend if you have other questions about some of these concepts, uh, definitely visit the the YouTube uh, our YouTube channels to um, understand more. Yeah. So if people wanted to get a hold of us, Kevin, how would they do it? They would reach out to us by email uh, <clears throat> or they can uh, find us on LinkedIn uh, uh, and uh, connect with us. Here are our email addresses. Are there any other channels of communication we should put out there? Uh, so I think we're also you can find us a lot at the uh, Industry 4.0 Discord as well. Um, we yes, we, we stir you. up a lot of trouble there, too. <laughs> it's fun stuff. Good. Awesome. Yep. Great. Great. Great video. Thank you, everybody, for uh, watching the video. Please make sure to subscribe and uh, provide uh, feedback. Uh, and we are looking forward to doing another video. All right. Very Thank good. You all. Well, thanks, Kevin. Great way to spend yeah. the afternoon. Same.